I'd like to start off by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet, uh, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, welcome everybody to this uh, very special Caston Centre event um, hosting Kenneth Brock. Uh, as is usual, the Caston Centre will be tweeting this event and we'd like to invite our members of the audience to tweet along if they would like. The hashtag we're using is CCBrock. Um, uh, it's not posted up on the wall, so it's on the it's on the screen, so that's fine, and there's logging information. So, a um, uh, bit of information about our speaker. Our speaker, Kenneth Roth, is the Executive Director of Human Rights Watch, one of the world's leading international human rights organisations. It operates in more than 90 countries, um, including now Australia, um, out of Sydney though, unfortunately, <laughs> which uh, uh, I won't say any more about that. Um, Prior to joining Human Rights Watch in 1987, um, Roth served, uh, Ken Roth served as a federal prosecutor in New York and for the Iran Contra investigation in Washington, D.C. Um, Ken Roth has conducted numerous human rights investigations and missions around the world. He's written extensively on a wide range of human rights abuses, devoting special attention to issues of international justice, counterterrorism, foreign policies of the major powers, and the work of the United Nations. Uh, today, he's going to be talking to us about surveillance and the right to privacy in a digital age. So, can you please welcome Ken. Well, thank you. It's very nice to be here. Um, and thank you all for showing up. Um, I guess I, I should get used to this idea of you know, tweeting as I talk. So, maybe, um, maybe I'll, my contribution is to say my, my handle is very complicated. It's, you know, Ken Roth. So if you're, if you're going to tweet, throw that in and um, people know what you're talking about. Um, anyway, the, the subject today, just to kind of clarify, um, I'm not talking about all surveillance. Because you know, some surveillance is fine. I think it's, we sometimes forget that. But, but targeted surveillance, where there is you know, evidence to justify listening to somebody's phone call or, or reading somebody's email, and you go before a judge and you say, you know, here's the evidence. Um, I want to order, I mean, let's redo this, um, nobody's contesting it. You know, and that's the traditional way you investigate crime. Um, so it, it's not as if we're sort of giving carte blanche to terrorism, carte blanche to crime. Um, there is an appropriate role for surveillance, it's targeted surveillance. Um, my discussion today is going to be about mass surveillance, bulk surveillance. You know, the effort to sort of scoop up all of our communications data and, and a lot of our communications. Um, just because they can. And, and that's what I would like to address. And what I thought I would do today is to run through what I see as sort of three key legal arguments, rationale, for why this mass surveillance can be place. And I'm going to focus um, somewhat more on the law in the United States, because I think in an odd way, it's been more developed. And we know a bit more about it because of Snowden's disclosures. Uh, what I say, I suspect, applies very directly to the law here as well. Although I you know, many of you are more expert on this than, than I am. But I think that um, there would be a very close correlation between the rationale that Washington uses and the rationale that Canberra uses. You know, both of them partners in the so-called Five Eyes surveillance program along with New Zealand, Canada, and UK to you know, collectively scoop up as much of our communications as possible. So um, you know, without apologies for being a little bit US oriented, I still think it's going to have quite a bit of relevance to your situation here. So let me go through and, and highlight what I think are the big three logical fallacies behind the legal rationale for this mass surveillance. Um, the first has to do with our metadata. And you know, that, that's a kind of technical term. I think many of you come to understand what it means. Well, let me take a moment and define it. Um, the metadata is not the contents of our communications. The metadata is, in a sense, the information about our communications. So um, if it's a phone call, if the metadata says, you know, who you called or who called you, you know, how long you spoke, it, it, it's sort of the parameters around the conversation, but not the contents itself. Um, with an email, it's, you know, who did you send an email to? Who did you receive it? But you know, it, it gets quite a bit more than that. It, it's basically, what did you search for on the web? You know, which websites did you browse? And, and the big one, which people tend not to think about, 
is, you know, where did you go? And people say, what do you mean? That, that's not communications. What are, you, what are you talking about? Well, you know, this is a tracking device. And, and wherever I go, this tells the government where I am. And, you know, right now it's sort of innocuous. They can figure it out pretty quickly. But, you know, you can imagine if I'm visiting my psychiatrist or visiting, you know, some, some, some you know, secret contact I've got to talk to about, you know, some Chinese abuse or, I mean, you can think of a lot of things that I wouldn't want to disclose. But this is just, you know, an open book right now. This is part of my metadata. And the government scoops it up. Now, I will make a confession about my past. I used to collect metadata. Uh, before I was a human rights activist, I used to be a prosecutor in the United States. And um, the metadata that I picked up was phone data. Um, there were things called pen registers. And you could get a court order and you could put this little thing on a phone line and we could record um, every phone number that somebody dialed. And this was legal. I'll get to a moment why that was legal. But, um, my point I want to make is that this was some time ago. And in order to make use of that, I would have to physically compile. I would have to kind of look through the numbers and say, hmm, that number looks interesting. Let's you know, look up who that person is. And, and you know, you'd have to you know, really physically track step by step how, um, you know, where those phone calls went. And that was very time consuming. So there were you know, real practical limits to what I could do with that. Fast forward to the present. Today, um, first of all, the, the metadata, as I mentioned, is not just phone calls. It's you know, our entire electronic existence, which is a big part of our lives. You know, it's a different era today. But <coughs> the big difference also is that the government's capacity to analyze that data is vastly improved. You know, it, it's just, you know, it's like it, it, it's a totally different era. You know, nobody sits there and you know, figures out you know, who's that email first in the address or, you know. What is that website? You know, they, they do this all with, with these massive computer programs that do big data analysis. And with a few clicks on, on the, the mouse, they can reconstruct your life. Um, so you know, there the are big, big differences between the early days of pen registers and contemporary practice, where um, there is you know, the ability to reconstruct very quickly this huge dimension of your lives. Now, how does the government get away with this? Back in the days of pen registers, the US Supreme Court had a case. And they ruled that there was no privacy interest in the phone numbers that you dialed. Now, you know, why is that? You know, you, 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 you could think for a moment and say, well, you know, wouldn't they have said that, you know, just like when you when you, you know, make some kind of confidential disclosure to a lawyer, they have a duty to preserve that confidence, or when you make a confidential disclosure to a doctor, they have a duty to preserve that. Why isn't the phone company the same thing? Don't they have a fiduciary duty to preserve the secrecy of the communications? No, they didn't go that way. They decided that the phone company is a, an entirely unrelated third party with no duties to you at all. And so once you disclose that phone number, once you share that phone number with the phone company, you have given up your privacy. That seems wacko, but that's what they decided. That was the US Supreme Court. It didn't matter that much back then. It matters a whole lot now. Because this sharing rationale is what lets the government claim that we have no privacy interest whatsoever in all that metadata, all those different dimensions of our lives. And it is, has become so outrageous that the Supreme Court has actually begun to question whether this makes sense. And there was a case three years ago where they started probing and, and, and suggesting that if the proper case came before them, they may revisit this sharing rationale. But for the time being, um, sharing, in the sense that you know, we share our you know, email with the internet company or our you know, web browsing with Google, that that is um, the end of your privacy interest. That's what US law is right now. And clearly, Australia takes the same view. Um, so that's you know, one crazy part of the law. Now, what's interesting is that Obama just last week began backing off. He, he didn't say anything legal. You know, he didn't say, you have a privacy interest, your privacy right, and you know, that would be too much. But he did announce 
uh, this new procedure. He basically said the U.S. government is getting out of the business of collecting that data. Um, and from now on, we are going to require an evidentiary showing. It's a little unclear what that's going to be. It's not going to be probable cause, which is what it would take for a, a formal search warrant. It's going to be probably some kind of you know, reasonably articulable suspicion. But at least it'll be something. And it will um, have to go before a judge before the government can inquire into our metadata. So you know, that's a, um, that's a good step. But we have to recognize that he was one only talking about our phone metadata. Um, so you know, who knows what he thinks about our emails and our web browsing. Or you know, it gets worse than this, because um, you know, our banking records. I mean, there, there are lots of things that we think about as private. <coughs> that somebody else holds the data too, and therefore the sharing rationale could apply to them. We have no idea what the government thinks about any of this. So um, there's, some, you know, there's some work to be done there. Um, we are not clear what the, the standard for probing the metadata is going to be. They're going to work this out with the Congress. And we, um, there still, as I said, is no recognition that we have a right here. This is a discretionary move that could be discretionarily taken away. So that's where we are right now. You know, step in the right direction, but not far enough. Now, the second legal fiction is that when the government scoops up all this data and puts it into these vast computers that they're now able to maintain, that that doesn't implicate your privacy that your privacy is only implicated when the government looks at the data, when it reads the email, when it, you know, or read, even if it's just data, you know, it, 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 when it somehow examines the communications data. And that's why you know, they, they just are kind of taking a vacuum cleaner and just you know, blowing all the stuff into a computer. And, and they say you know, they're, they're free to do this. And the rationale they give is the best argument they can make is you need a haystack to find the needle. And that's really the argument they make. Um, and you know, if, if you sort of think this through, that that you know facile metaphor essentially trashes the kind of restrictions that, that, that we thought existed before the government could could take a step into our privacy. But they, you know, that's all. They're just using a metaphor. They're not using any legal argument. And in fact, there hasn't been a public court that has examined this. The only court that has approved this haystack rationale has been the secret FISA court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act court, which not only has no public accountability, but doesn't even hear from anybody other than a government lawyer. And you know, so you can just imagine how this argument went. We need our haystack. Oh, OK. You know, we'll, we'll sign off on that. You know, I mean, that, that, was, like, that was the extent of it. Uh, so this is now you know, exposed. This is being debated. And, and here again, Obama. Uh, seems to take a step in the right direction. He says um, the U.S. government isn't going to maintain the haystack anymore, at least for phone metadata. We don't know about the others. Um, the haystack is going to be kept with private companies. Now, that sounds not so great, but it's actually better than what's happened here, because here the government was proposing a couple of years ago that it would require private companies to maintain a haystack that was you know, two years old. So they would force all the metadata to be held by the private companies for, for a couple of years. Um, Obama's not saying that. Obama's saying, we will let the private companies retain this metadata for however long they ordinarily would, whatever their ordinary business requirements are. We're not going to demand more than that. And so it actually is a relatively minimalistic approach to this. Um, it is. Um, in many ways, the least that they can do. Because if you think about you know, these intrusions on our privacy as supposedly justified by what's needed to protect us from terrorism, and that was the original rationale. One of the interesting things about the debate launched by Snowden is that we've been able to ask probing questions. You know, and, and at first, they said, you know, this is essential for our national security, and if you give up these programs, you know, you're going to have terrorists, you know, Al Qaeda's going to be walking down the street. And, and you know, they, they use the usual panicked arguments. But when you start probing them, they don't have anything to say. 
that I actually met with the White House counsel. And I asked her, um, so tell me, um, were there any terrorist plots that wouldn't have been broken but for the mass scooping up of this metadata? And she said, oh, you know, you got to understand, you got to think about it as a, a, you know, a kind of a whole panoply, and this is just part of the broader picture. And, and, but she wouldn't answer the question. And, and there's been probing now. And, and basically, the bottom line is they can't name a terrorist plot that was broken where this mass collection of metadata was essential. In fact, the best case they could come up with sort of almost shows you how, how weak their argument is. It was a guy in San Diego who wired some money to the Al-Shabaab in Somalia. And that, you know, wire transfers are monitored anyhow. I mean, it's clear that the mass surveillance had nothing to do with anything in that case. But that's the best case that you come up with. So, you know, in these circumstances, you've got um, no, no record of successful raking with terrorist plots because of this mass surveillance. Um, and a, a very substantial intrusion on our privacy. And so for that reason, there is retrenchment. And at least on phone metadata, Obama has moved much back to a more sensible position. As I said, it remains to be seen what, what the positions and everything else. And a lot of this is also going to require congressional approval, where given the dysfunction of the United States, you know, a lot can go wrong. So um, but that's where we are there. The third um, rationale behind the surveillance program is one that you all have got to be particularly worried about. I don't have to worry about it so much. Because um, this is the view of the US government that um, even the contents of our communications, so you know what you say on the phone, what you write in the email, you don't have a privacy interest in that that the US government has to recognize insofar as you are not a US citizen or not in the United States. So you know, I don't know how many of you are US citizens here, um, but you're the only ones who are protected here from the US government surveillance. Every one of the rest of you, it is fair game in the US government's view to listen to your phone calls and to read your emails. That is the state of the law that the US government um, provides on. And now you may say, oh, well, you know, at least I don't care what Washington does. At least the you know, Australian government isn't going to listen in on my phone calls. But um, you know, the Australian government is, is part of the Five Eyes program. And so if it can't listen on your phone calls, you can just ask Washington, would you mind listening in on these guys? And, and you know, collect things in that way. Or at least you know, we don't know if they can't. But we have to assume that they can, because our worst assumptions have tended to be true. Um, so that, um, now you know, how do they get away with that? They, they, they read international human rights law very, very narrowly. They read it as not applying outside of their territory except to a citizen of their country. Um, last week, the um, UN Human Rights Committee reviewed this claim and said, no way, you know, this, this is not our understanding of the law. But the US government, and here Obama is no different from his predecessors, are not willing to recognize this extraterritorial application of international human rights law. And so that is how they, um, they get away with listening to your calls and reading emails. So those are the three legal rationale that have guided this mass surveillance. You, know, you have no interest, privacy interest in your metadata. Um, your privacy interests are not implicated when your data goes into a government computer, only when somebody analyzes it. And even the contents of your communications are fair game as long as you're a non-American outside the United States. Now, what are we going to do about this? Um, the, there's a right answer and a wrong answer to that, in my view. Um, and I'm speaking very broadly here for, for lack of time. But the right answer, in my view, is for us to um, strengthen our understanding of what the international right of privacy means, um, to strengthen our understanding of, of international um, you know, the problem with, with any right is it's, you know, it's written in very broad language. And you know, what does the right to privacy mean? So we have to interpret this for the modern age. And there is a process that Germany and Brazil have begun at the UN Human Rights Council 
which is um, in principle going to lead to a more detailed understanding of the right to privacy with respect to electronic communications. Is, um, there are two concerns I have with that process, though. Um, one is that there is a tendency right now to view privacy and free expression as distinct concerns. And part of this is just politics. I mean, if you're the US government and anybody starts talking about privacy, you like to talk about free expression. Um, it's kind of a way to change the subject. The US is pretty good on free expression. And, and it's, you know, if, if people who are suspicious look at the US government and say, ah, you know, you're just trying to you know, make yourself out look that quite so bad. And so there's a tendency for people to say, we're only going to talk about privacy. Um, that's a mistake, I think, because for, for a couple of reasons. I mean, one is that uh, privacy and, and free expression are actually very closely related. I mean, if, if I, you know, have a secret that I want to express, I'm not going to express it if I don't feel that I can do it with my privacy security. And so there's just you know, a, a very essential aspect where, where certain kinds of expression that you don't want to broadcast to the world are not going to be set if there is not some degree of protection for privacy. But my other concern has to do with um, the many governments that are willing to exploit their ability to identify who is communicating, their ability to get through the right to privacy in order to actively suppress speech. And this is particularly dangerous with respect to the reaction that many people have had, which is, aha, if the, if the NSA is you know, snooping on us and we can't trust our data to go anywhere near the United States because the NSA is just going to tap into it and take it, let's carve up the internet. You know, let's try to create little national internets. And, and that way, um, you know, if you're in Australia, I mean, unless you're communicating with somebody outside of Australia, your data's going to never leave Australia. And that way, you're going to be protected from the prying eyes of the NSA. And, you know, Brazil is talking about this, and Germany is talking about this, and you can just envision, you know, there'd be an EU net, and, a, um, you know, maybe a, a CANS net. You know, and, and, and you can just imagine the little net set up. Now, it's not even clear to me that that's physically possible. You know, so, so let's, you know, posit that at the outset. Um, it's not really the way the internet operates right now. It tends to, to, you know, just move data wherever it's easiest and you have no idea. I mean, you can be communicating with somebody in Sydney and for all you know, it's going to, you know, go by in Nairobi. So, um, it's very difficult to control that just given the way the internet is structured. But my greater concern is that, um, Think of this in terms of China. If you are an internet company these days, you know that you had better not store your user data in China. Because um, the Chinese government likes to ask, who was it who was saying that subversive stuff about Tiananmen Square, or about the Falun Gong, or about you know, the Dalai Lama? And um, give me his name, you know, give me the address, give me the, the shop where that was done. And the, the answer to internet companies has been, that data is not in China. We don't have to give it to you. We're storing it in Palo Alto or wherever. Um, and that has worked. You know, it's been enough of a kind of legal fiction to allow internet companies to resist Chinese efforts to identify um, subversive thought on the internet. Now, imagine what happens if suddenly the world was divided into kind of localized nets. Well, China's going to love it. And they would like nothing better than to suddenly feel justified in insisting that there be a China net. And that anybody who uses the internet in China, all their data has to stay in China, where they can get it. And it's easier for them to then identify who it is who is saying these subversive things. So, you know, if you're really concerned about privacy, you've got to think about the consequences for free expression as well. So in my view, this, this, you know, this reflex of response of saying, let's carve up the nets so the NSA can't get to our stuff, is not really thought through. It's, it's a dangerous trend. And instead, I think what we should be doing is focusing on strengthening the standards for privacy and free expression 
and come to a, a much more detailed understanding of what those concepts mean in our you know, age of electronic communications. So let me just conclude by saying that um, I know people like to say, oh, Edward Snowden, he was a you know, traitor, what he did is treasonous, this has set back our security for eons. Um, I think Snowden did us an enormous service. Um, because until the Snowden disclosures, many people suspected what we come to know is the reality, that nobody knew for sure. And Snowden has demonstrated that, in fact, we have a lot to worry about for our privacy in protecting it from this massive governmental surveillance. When um, privacy decisions are made behind closed doors, they tend to not come out very well for our privacy. Now, the great irony is the best way to protect our privacy is public. And that what Snowden has started is the long needed public debate about what the right balance is between our privacy and our security concerns. And there's a, a very substantial rejuvenation that's going to be needed in order to um, come to what I think is the appropriate protection that our privacy deserves. So let me conclude there, and I welcome your questions. Which is um, a combination of sort of NGOs and governments and internet companies 
it was designed mainly to set standards about what it would be like to operate in China. Um, but it, it's, you know, it's applicable more broadly, it's written in broad language. And the, it focused you know, on one hand on, on protection of, of user data, and that's where this, this standard came with not putting your user data into a oppressive country. It also focused a lot on, on search, because you know, what we found is that search companies, when they were operating in China, um, initially were very deferential to Chinese re requests for censorship. And the, you know, the, the firewall was set up, um, and the companies would say, well, we'll just, you know, you're blocking everything with the firewall. But China actually didn't want to have the firewall be responsible. They wanted the search company to block you know, unsavory searches. And so these companies would actually sort of probe the firewall and figure out what was being blocked, and then they block a little bit more so they wouldn't get in trouble. You know? and, and this was all done voluntarily. You know, voluntary. It was all done you know, without any formality to it. And so one of the things that Jim and I did is to say, that's not how you should operate. You should be much more, um, you know, much, much less cooperative, um, much more insistent on having laws that really, you know, force you to do things. You've got to abide by local laws, but make it hard for the Chinese. You know, make them cite the law, make them give you detailed orders. And, and so it's just kind of changed the relationship between these censorship requests and the responses of the governments. Now, with something, I mean, with Wild Bike, the, what that was really about was you know, setting up a way of, um, of communicating that was supposed to be super secure. Um, and you were able to be able to operate anonymous, anonymously, you were able to encrypt your um, communications, and because there was an explicit promise that this was like ultra secure, they felt that they had to go out of business rather than respond even to what I think was a fairly targeted request in that sense. And, you know, I mean, I wouldn't object in principle, and as I opened up with, by, to targeted requests. I mean, if there is a, a crime that's committed, and the government has evidence that communications with respect to that crime are in a particular server, they can, they can search for that particular communication. A lot of I didn't want to go even that far, and that's why they, they shut down. Um, I, you know, I wouldn't object to having an Australian lava as a you know a strategy to avoid um, those kinds of subpoenas, but that's very different from carving up the net. You know, that's really just setting up a, a company that would allow private communications in some jurisdiction that's deemed more friendly. You know, right now a lot of these people who have been involved in kind of working with Snowden and working on these issues, they all set up shop in the meta section. East Berlin. You know, why? You know, they just think it's safer there, you know? And it's, it's because of the, you know, the combination of the history of the Stasi and the, the history of the Nazis, and, and they're just convinced that, you know, Angela Merkel is not going to allow them to be prosecuted there. And so that's sort of the equivalent of an Australian law you know? It's, God knows if they're right or not, you know, I, there's no legal reason for them to have made that calculation. And it is just kind of a political assessment. So you know, I think it's fine to sort of make those judgments. What's the most secure way to operate? There clearly is a lot more interest in encryption. Um, there's Tor, which is a very effective tool. And, and so I think that's all fine. And I think you know, anything you can do to try to enhance the security of your communications, by all means do it. There is some um, you know, inconvenience associated with using these services. And you know, I personally don't follow it. You know, I just kind of have to operate on the assumption that somebody's reading my communication, they probably are. Um, you know, but that's my personal choice about how I want to spend my time. But I can very much appreciate and respect somebody who chooses the added difficulty of using Tor all the time and encouraging everything. You know, because that is one way that works. Okay, I've got one question there and then another question on the top. It's um, been almost 13 years since our highest court um, left the door slightly open as to whether there's going to be a common law right of privacy in Australia, but nothing's really developed since then, or significant. Um, in America, um, where the Supreme Court has been quite strong on privacy, such as Jones in the USA and an earlier decision, as being the privacy right, that to me seems to be quite an artificial way of approaching the privacy issue that you're referring to. And also, the Supreme Court seems to be quite um, limited in its uh, interpretation of uh, the tort of seclusion, the Brandis uh, um, approach to statutory tort of privacy. Given those, the, the, what I think is a quite limited approach to the US Supreme Court on, on 
uh, in Jones and early incisions. How do you see a way forward that the Supreme Court can actually deal with the, the nub of the issue outside of a Fourth Amendment uh, analysis? Well, I actually read the Jones case a little bit differently. And so let, let me explain what the Jones case is for this one. This was a case I decided, I guess, three years ago now. And um, it, it was about um, the police wanted to put a tracking device, a basically GPS device, on a car um, as a way of keeping track of where the car's going. And you know, traditionally, the courts have ruled that there is no right not to be surveilled. So the police want to take the time and effort of putting a surveillance team on the street and trying to secretly follow you. They're free to do that. That is ruled not to implicate your privacy. But again, that has the same practical limitations as my days back you know, with a pen register. I actually used to do that physical surveillance too in certain investigations. And it's incredibly time consuming. It's expensive. And you just can't do very much of it. So there are big practical limitations to it. The reason the police wanted to put this tracking device on a car is because they could just sit back in their office and watch the computer and figure out where this person's going. You know, and it didn't take any work and it didn't cost anything. Um, and they could record it all. They could even go home and you know, play with the kids and come back in the morning and see where the person went. So um, that greater ease of monitoring was sort of an issue with the court. And the court could have come out and said, you know, this is a different world. Um, we're, we're, we're concerned about this, um, this ease of electronic monitoring. Uh, and they didn't do that. There were actually five of the nine justices, so a majority, that had concerns about whether this electronic tracking, whether the whole sharing rationale worked or not, you know, whether, whether it was time to reassess. Um, but Sonia Sotomayor, who is a, um, I guess, the newest justice, an Obama appointee, um, relatively progressive. Um, she basically said, I have problems with this kind of electronic tracking, but I'm not going to reach that decision here. Even though I've got five votes on my side, I'm going to vote with a narrower rationale for, cutting, for, for rejecting this kind of surveillance. And they use the idea of trespass, you know, that, that physically putting that tracking device on the car was a trespass, and therefore um, a violation of the Fourth Amendment. And, you know, fine it was, but, but that was a narrow way of looking at it. It was a way of dodging the real electronic surveillance question. She basically said so much. And the way I interpret that is that she was giving her friend Obama a warning. She was saying, um, this kind of, you know, electronic surveillance is a real problem. I'm going to give you a chance to clean up your act before we rule on it. So we're kicking this case down the road, even though we could have reached a broader conclusion here. We're not going to. We're going to take the narrow view of it. Um, there'll be another case. I hope before that next case comes, you clean up your act. And Obama has actually now just, you know, is starting to, to respond to that. When I, you know, I've met with the White House people on this a number of times, and I brought up the Jones case. Um, and they said, we know that case very well. And they, you know, they did. Um, they, they, they read it the same way I did, that this was a, you know, a warning. So um, I, I don't view the Fourth Amendment so narrow. I actually think the Fourth Amendment can be reinterpreted. In the court, there seem to be five justices. It's the four liberals plus Alito, who's usually conservative. But in this case, seems to be siding with the liberals on, on the privacy issue. So we'll see. Um, it may, the case may not come before the court because Obama may just change things. But if, if he doesn't change things adequately, the next case before the court may come out quite differently on Fourth Amendment grounds. I think we've got a question. Yeah, three quick comments. Um, that I speak to somebody with an American and an Australian passport, and I figured that just makes me doubly liable because they're both doing it. Um, I hope everybody saw the revelations, the Snowden revelations in the Australian edition of The Guardian on the 2nd or 3rd of December, which revealed that at a, GCH, at a meeting of the Five Eyes at GCHQ in 2008, the Australian Signals Directorate, now the Australian Defense Signals, now Australian Signals Directorate, happily offered to share with all the other Five Eyes all the metadata uh, about every Australian citizen. And, and the Canadians objected on the grounds that it might violate their privacy laws. And the husbands just laughed. We don't have any problem at all with this. You can have it. So, you know, we've been, we know they've been doing it in at least the run up to 2008. I take your point about not uh, coming up the kind of carving up the internet um, and the anger that exists in a lot of global south countries over what the Americans have been doing. The, the point about that is, however, and I agree with your, your observation on not wanting to carve it up, but 
And I work for a technology company. So we are very concerned about this and very involved in, and I'll come to that in a second, about some of the attempts to stop it. But it's not like the net is neutral. It is very heavily dominated by the American government and American companies. ICANN is an American institution. It assigns all the DMS addresses. And there's no particular reason why that has to be the case. And most of your communications go through servers in the United States because of the domination of the Googles, the Apples, the Microsofts, the Oracles, and all of that. So that, I, I mean, so I think that there is something to fighting the American domination by, by government and private corporations of the internet the way it is currently structured. And I think some restructuring is going to have to happen. Which kind of brings me to the third point. So I think most people would know that the Brazilian government has called this conference in, in April uh, Ned Mundial and is fighting other governments and private companies, and we're going to be very, very represented at a company I work for, ThoughtWorks. And one of the initiatives that we're taking there is, is Tim Berners Lee recently started this thing called the Web We Want. I don't think he knows exactly what he wants to do with that, but to kind of try to reclaim the web for the people. And there's an, an associated movement called the Tech We Want to try to build, and it's a lot of it's a lot of encryption, to try to build encrypted email, encrypted databases, encrypted Dropboxes, so that you can actually lock the Americans out of your and that is something we are very interested in coming together with other NGOs, other technology companies, other government organizations. So if you'd like to talk to us more about that, look me up afterwards. Thank you. And I appreciate your comment on this one. Thank you. Well, no, I, mean, I agree that you know, encryption and anonymization is, is the way to go. There's going to be pushback. And, and you know, this is one of the things we're facing is that, you know, keep in mind the legitimate use of surveillance. Um, if, if everything is encrypted, you know, um, there, you know, what they argue back is that, well, we can't, um, then we're not going to find the real criminals, even with our targeted requests. And, you know, it's their fault we've gotten to this point, but that doesn't eliminate the real dilemma that they face. And, um, you know, this is the problem that when they ask, when they try to insert these weaknesses or insert keys, it's not just the good guy law enforcement agencies that can be able to exploit those, it's the Chinese or anybody else, too. So um, there's not an easy solution here. In terms of the Americanization, um, I mean, I, would, I view those two things a little bit differently, the two that you mentioned. The domination of, you know, of American internet companies, you know, it's a commercial reality, it can be fought. You know, it's, it's I just let the marketplace operate there. But I, you know, by all means, come up with alternatives. I don't think anybody's challenging that. Um, I am worried about the idea that I can, which is the, you know, it's a funny agency. It's, it's the agency that assigns internet names. Um, and it is very US dominated. It's not exactly a government agency, but it's, um, it's, it's very influenced by the United States. And there is an effort to um, change the governance structure and make it look more like the United Nations. And I worry about that, because even though you know, I'm no fan of the US government these days and the way it operates on surveillance, um, I'm not thrilled with the idea of you know, putting China and Russia and the likes in, in major governance positions. And, and we haven't come up with a good formula that would ensure that the only people sitting on a, you know, an ICANN too are the ones who are actually committed to free expression and privacy. So that's the, the dilemma that we face. And um, for the time being, I'd rather stick with ICANN as it is, rather than create a, you know, a new structure that would legitimize a much more censorious approach to the internet. So that's my concern there. Okay, we've got a question over here. And I might ask if someone could signal from this side, because we can take a question from this side. Um. <coughs> talking about lots of countries, lots of grown up countries with things called human rights. Uh, here we live in this vast, beautiful place uh, with no rights at all, no human rights to build. Um, but our beaches are so lovely it appears that uh, uh, we have been sucked into a form of complacency uh, such that we Im compulsorily imprison in concentration camps by definition. Uh, refugees, we mistreat our indigenous people. As I said, we have no Human Rights Act. You said that the best way to protect your privacy is publicly. How would you suggest, and what, well, what experience do you have from abroad, how would you suggest that we possibly shape this country out of its complacency and, and, and get this information across? Well, I mean, I've actually been quite taken aback by the, the radical shift in this government over the last year. And um, you know, I've been spending quite a bit of time during my brief visit here in Australia talking about it. And, and I've really been surprised by how surprised people are to hear the criticism. You know, and when I, um, 
you know, when I you know, when I sort of do a legal analysis about you know why what happened in Manus Island or Nauru is still very much Australia's responsibility because of the non-refoulement requirement, or when I talk about how Julie Bishop was you know completely outside the consensus of every Western ally and indeed even Australia's allies in Asia, um, you know, Australia alone condemned the um, U.S. Human Rights Council resolution last week on Sri Lanka. You know, what's going on? Here? You know, and but I, 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 most people don't seem to know. You know, and so I, you know, responding to your question, that you've got to begin by by talking about this publicly and making a more regular part of it. Public opinion is very much a product of the information that's out there. And um, yeah, I realize there are problems with media in this country, but there still are, you know, there are ways to get the word out. And I'm spending a lot of my time this week talking about these things. But um, you know, a lot more you than me. And so I, I mean, I think that that's got to be a big part of the end. Yeah. Thank you very much, Luke. I have to firstly say my apologies because I, I could not break my other engagements so I arrived late, so my apologies if you've already covered this. But uh, I just wanted to get a sense of your reaction to the concept of this social contractarian idea about privacy that is held by some circles, individuals. I know in the States there's a big debate at the moment about how far the NSA goes with respecting the notion whether privacy should, the standard of privacy in the US is treated differently, for example, than an international standard of privacy. Um, and I know that the president's, um, uh, the PPD policy 28, which is the president's policy directive, now has, I think it's article four, and it's uh, an acknowledgement that international persons and beings do have privacy entitlements, but it doesn't go as far as to accept privacy of those people is necessarily going to have concrete legal protections. And um, the commission, the presidential commission investigating the intelligence community, which released its report in December last year, also made comments to that effect. And I was just wondering how far you think the steps have to go here, whether you think it's sufficient what has been done so far, whether you think there has to be a more concrete manifestation of an international privacy right, for want of a better term. Yeah. Well, I, I did talk about this. And it's, I mean, you know, just to quickly sum up, and we can talk more in private. But the, I mean, the U.S. view is that um, it owes no obligation to the privacy of anybody who is either not an American citizen or in the United States, um, and that's the way it interprets the extent of the obligation under international human rights law. The Human Rights Committee disagrees, um, but that's that's where things stand. Um, thanks for your talk today. Um, the mandatory data retention um, argument proposal is something that has been reinlightened in Australia over the last couple of months, um, including law enforcement agencies saying that that should extend to searching browsing history, all our URLs. Um, and the fallacy that you talked about about metadata. Um, that it's, it's an argument that our politicians don't seem to be getting. We've had Tanya Plibersek on the weekend mm -hmm. saying metadata is just like an envelope. It's not giving us much more. We shouldn't be concerned. I was just wondering from an advocacy sort of perspective if you had any tips on how we can convince our government to look at these um, issues in a bit more sophisticated manner. Why don't we ask the next politician who mentions this? <laughs> whether they've ever visited a porn site and whether they'd like to share that with us. <laughs> and, 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 you know, let's get real here. You know, I mean, that's what your, your browsing, maybe not here, but you know, that's what one's browsing record, you know, could reveal. Um, you know, or, or, you know, to, to make it more political, you know, if you're, if you're a dissident and you're, you know, secretly, um, you know, visiting some website that is, you know, with others who share your views, is that the government's business? You know, it, it, these, metadata is incredibly revealing. Um, it shows, you know, who your friends are, who your associates are, um, who you're visiting for, for whatever reasons, and we have a lot of legitimate reasons to want to keep parts of our life private. And it, it's not, it's not just the envelope, you know, it's, because the problem is the envelope, you know, again, I, I opened with this, 
to actually look at all these envelopes, these massive entanglements, to look at your metadata these days can be done very, very quickly and easily. So I, I just, um, I think we got to sort of, you know, think of through examples. I mean, do they want to advertise every time they've seen a shrink? You know, does every one of them want to advertise every affair they've ever had, which is what their metadata is going to reveal when they start looking at their, their geolocation? Um, you know, do they never want to permit the possibility that they would have, you know, some kind of secret meeting? Um, and, and that's, you know, there's lots of life that we don't want to advertise. And, and even politicians don't shine a spotlight in every aspect of their life. So I think you just got to make it very concrete about what we're talking about. Uh, there's one more back here. Thanks. In a recent um, edition of the Foreign Affairs magazine, there's an interesting article saying basically that the, the metadata is um, growing so fast and all the services that are yet to come will increase that, that we should be focusing on the use of data rather than its collection focusing all the uh, energy on that. Do you have a view? Yeah, I mean, I read that article. It, it was an interesting article in the sense that it, 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 you know, it said we shouldn't, be so, we shouldn't be so black and white about this. And that it's not simply a matter of whether the, there's a right to privacy, but that there are you know, legitimate uses for different aspects of our metadata. And you know, I think that that's a fair point, particularly with respect to companies that have access to our private information. And I think you know, that was sort of the gist of, of that article. You know, it, it, it may be that you know, we don't really care if Facebook puts ads on the side of our, you know, our, our feed um, based on you know, what it thinks you're interested in. And you may be willing to put up with that use of your metadata there. But you wouldn't want them sharing it with the general public. You know? and, and so I think those kinds of um, somewhat more detailed analysis of what kinds of uses can we live with is a particularly relevant way of going about trying to regulate private companies' access. Um, but it doesn't, I think when it comes to the government, we've got to start with the basics, which is we have a right here. You know, that if we didn't share that right away, this waiver argument isn't adequate. And we've got to get past that argument first before we get into some of the more refined points about, you know, could they use this legitimately for some purposes and not others. Um. I might uh, conclude um, just by asking the last question. Then I'll give thanks. Can you give us uh, an impression in, in the states of where public opinion is at on this? Is it um, is it pro Snowden, which is that? Well, that, that's actually sort of a sideshow. But is it um, uh, are people concerned about this? Are they angry about it? Would they like the NSA to stop doing this, or are they buying the um, you know the the because terrorism argument? <laughs> but, um, well, I, the, the because terrorism argument is wearing it thin. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think that that's kind of been exposed at this stage. I do, I, I've been disappointed by how blase many Americans are about this. And this is sort of, you know, the Facebook generation. And, and people tend to equate Facebook with every other form of stuff. And they figure, you know, I'm posting it on Facebook, what do I care? And, you know, or you, you know, people say, what do I have to hide, you know? And, and I think that that's a sort of facile response to it. Um, that said, there is a you know, very significant elite concern about this. And as a result, the press is very focused on this. And that is what's driving this right now. Because you know, no administration, no politician likes to be lambasted by the press. And so even though the press focus is not matched by a popular focus, it's been adequate to create real pressure on Washington. Well, because I was thinking about when you said Obama started to move the rest with phones. Actually, just a point of fact, if, we're, if they're not tracking phones with a smartphone, would that mean your internet on the phone, or is it they, just your phone? No, 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 they, we don't know the answer to that yet. Okay. That's one of the big questions, you know. Does it include geolocation? Does it include um, browsing on the web? They're, 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 all he said is be very, very careful. It's your phone call okay. metadata. Okay, so yeah, and they, they know exactly what they're doing, and they haven't given away very much. So this is one of the pushback areas.